You got power, Andrew. That's pretty yeah, good. that's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Taxation. Didn't even need the phone. Taxation. You were saying. Um, yeah, I was. What I was saying is, we have this restaurant, but we don't have any customers. So I call you up on Saturday morning and said, I got an answer. Raise your prices. State cannot raise its prices. We are already not competitive. So we don't have a choice about raising taxes. Look, Strickland raised taxes in 93. He raised taxes a year ago. He'll raise taxes again. I mean, if, you know, if, if we think that raising taxes is going to get us out of this ditch, we're dead wrong. So it is incumbent on us to, to actually deal with this budget in a real way. The special interests and the lobbyists in this town have had their way for a long time. We asked the governor when he was here. We and is isn't going to have it with me. And when I was chairman of the budget committee, I went through every single program of the federal government. If it worked, we made it better. If it didn't work, we got rid of it. If we could combine it, we combined it. You have to treat this like a business, like you run your newspapers. What are my costs and what do I need to do to serve the customer better? That's exactly what we need to do in Ohio to pull ourselves out of this out of the spiral that we're in. We asked the governor, he said, we indicated that there's 35 states or 70% of the states that don't have an estate tax. Many of them are located in destination points where there's warm weather. Obviously, when people retire, they have a choice to make. We asked him, did he think that our estate tax caused capital to leave the state? He indicated he, did, he, he, he hedged a little bit on that. He said perhaps the state should take their component of the estate tax and eliminate it, but he hasn't done it. And perhaps then the local government part should stay, which is 80% of the tax. What's your, we'll ask you that same question. What's, what's your response? You know, when communities think that by holding on to taxes like this, this is going to fix them, um, I don't think they understand business. When you have the most successful entrepreneurs in this state who've created jobs leaving the state, how, how's that going to help us? We need to keep them in the state and we need to give them a reason to create a whole other set of jobs. But see, I don't think it is just, the I'm, so I've always said I want to get rid of that death tax at some point. The thing about the tax that I think drives a lot of our, you know, middle age has changed now. It's, what is middle age? Getting to approaching 70. Um, <laughs> That's what I think it is. Yeah, no, we all can agree on that in here. But the point of it is, no, seriously, you take a guy like Bob Walter, who built Cardinal Health, who's going to cash in his, uh, the value that he accumulated in that company. If he's in Florida not paying any income tax, and he's in Ohio paying 6.24, what do you think he's going to do? And we know what he's done. So we're driving people out. And we don't want to drive them out. And you know, you drive the job creators out. We wonder how are we going to keep the young people here. You know, you keep the young people here by having jobs here that people get, your kids get pumped up about. But if they're not pumped up about something, they're going to North Carolina, they're going to Austin, Texas, they're going to Indianapolis, they're going to other places. So that's why this income tax and getting these rates down as quickly as we can is so important. And the death tax is a, I mean, that's. We're, we're one of very few states that have this death tax. So all things in its time. You just you can't just, just kill taxes without downsizing, because we're back to the restaurant again. You can't raise prices, and you just can't slash them if you don't deal with your overhead. Lower your overhead, lower your prices, and then you get change the menu. So, uh, so that would be your approach. You do want to eliminate income taxes for the state of Ohio. Look, it's, this is a goal, you know, and it's a process. I mean, you just don't slash them. As I explained to one group this morning, uh, I just don't think you slash taxes without being able to deal with your overhead. So it is a, is a consistent effort. You lower overhead, you lower taxes, you generate a little bit more revenue, you keep working on this, you keep lowering your taxes, and you create prosperity. So... Um, you know, the, the deal is, let's create an environment with taxes, regulations, workers' comp, job training, higher ed, knowledge workers, that makes us really attractive. And I think we can absolutely do that in the state. See, I think we, we have so many good things that if we get moving on them and have a little vision and build a team of people who get this stuff, I think we can move the world quickly.
but I am deeply troubled by some of the problems in your communities. We've got to get jobs in these communities. Now, my approach to that is we've got to go to the communities. You can't just sit out here and say, well, all the sun will come up, it'll all be better. We've got to go to the places and figure out exactly what the, the people in these communities have to figure out what the assets are. And they've got to tell us how we can be helpful. And we've got to pay attention, and we've got to have people that understand what job creators do and how we can make companies stronger. So we can give them some of this relief. I think we're absolutely going to be you know, moving in the right direction for prosperity, not just in three C's, but across the state. We kill small town, we, we, we kill small town Ohio, we're killing the heartbeat of the state, and that is not acceptable to me. Well, Governor Strickland divided uh, government expenditure expenses and uh, said you have prisons, and you have Medicaid, and have education. Those are the biggest. Educate, Medicaid, and incarcerate. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. But that, I mean, that was, and, and he was saying, well, uh, we asked him, well, where could you cut there? And he said, well, we probably could reduce the prison expenses by taking nonviolent perpetrators and not keeping me in prison so long. I can't remember where else. Do you have any thoughts on Well, that? I think on the prisons, we want to make sure that people are confined in a place where the public's safe, but we don't want to put them in a setting where it costs a fortune, and so we're overdoing it. Yeah. So we have to take a look. at That's common sense. But, you know, prison reform, there's a guy named Bill Bratton, and Bill Bratton was the, uh, the police commissioner in New York City. And you might recall, he was the cover of Time magazine, and Rudy, he was getting too big for Rudy over there. He then, uh, he was in Boston, he w was there, he ran the transit system in New York City before he became commissioner, and then he went to L.A. and he ran that. I read his book, and I called him out of the blue, John Kasich calling for Bill Bratton. He, he took my call, and I said, what do we do about prisons? He said, it's the most unreformed part of government today. And so I think we need to be very innovative on this, and we've been thinking about the way to do it. And, but you don't want to confine somebody, over-confine somebody that costs the taxpayer a fortune when we can have them in a better setting where we're safe. And I got two 10-year-old daughters. My kids are going to be safe. But yet, I also don't want to be spending money that we don't have to have. So that'd be an area where we would have some agreement. What about Medicaid and education? Could that any, any... Well, shared services, repealed unfunded mandates, get dollars in the classroom. We're 46th in getting dollars in the classroom, and we're ninth in terms of overhead, red tape, and bureaucracy. I think we ought to have shared services uh, among our schools and our cities, and I think we ought to be looking at the unfunded mandates that, uh, that we can let the schools have more flexibility to run their operations. In, and, uh, you know, in terms of Medicaid, I just will start by saying when you have six different units of the state government touching the money, uh, it's not the way we run our business. But there's a lot, you know, but I'm not going to lay out partial budgets here until I have the numbers, and when they don't even have the numbers, it's pretty hard to do it. Are there too many school districts in Ohio? You just took my question. Well, <laughs> I, I, think, I think initially it is back to dollars in the classroom. Let me give you an example. This will make you shudder, I think, because you don't get these kind of dollars. But in Youngstown, it's over $13,000 per pupil, and less than 7000 go into the classroom. So we are funding so many things that are not directly related to the education of our What's kids. What's your definition of going into the classroom? Instruction. It's a pretty clear definition. Dollars in there that are involved in instruction, which would include the pay of the teachers and anything else that is in that classroom. And, and then we're ninth in overhead. So dollars in the classroom and these shared services. Right now, you know, you have, you know, from your counties, I'll bet you have multiple school districts but you don't have multiple sharing. I mean, how many superintendents do we need in one county? How many principals, assistant principals, curriculum advisors, outreach community people? Okay, so we need, to, we need to share. Now, in terms of do we have too many school districts, you know, that, that nothing is off the table over time. But you're not going to get that. That's not something that you, you just do quickly. I mean, it's, if, if there's an issue there and the legislature is raising that issue, then you have to have people take a look and figure out what, are we, what could we save if we did things better. Because if you can't show you're going to save money, you know, people are going to be less interested in what we would do there. But that's not, that's not in the front. The front, we've got to get the patient out of the ditch. We've got to get the budget balanced. We cannot raise taxes. 
and then there'll be things that we can do longer term, just like workers' comp. You know, you don't do that the first few months, you do that in the first year, but it's important we do it. And um, in terms of all these uh, levels of government, it's, it's something that, uh, that the legislature has shown an interest in, and they ought to keep looking at it. I think um, Rittman and Orville are sharing, Rittman and Orville are in Wayne County are sharing a super. They are, and we have a letter from them, I think. Is that the districts? And, you know, they're saving 1%, 2% of their operating costs by just sharing just some services, not even a full sharing of services. And God bless them for what they're doing. Because that's not easy for people mm -hmm. to do, you know? It's, um, you know, I... I met a girl just now, a young woman just now, who's from Cleveland, and she says, well, you'd like my boss. I said, why would, would that be? Well, because he's a Republican. I said, listen, and I know this sounds like political hype here, maybe, but we're all on the same team. Ohio's in trouble. We've got to all push and pull together to get us get ourselves out of this ditch. And in case you wonder, is that just talk? Look, I had Teddy Kennedy and Jesse Helms at the same press conference supporting Bono's effort to try to bring relief to Africa. I then got Pat Robertson into, the, into one of the rooms inside the White House to have a big meeting with Bill Clinton. I mean, talk about turning water into wine. I've never done it, but those things get pretty close. So we're, we're, we should all be of one mind on this. And to tell you another thing, Grand Lake St. Mary's. When Grand Lake St. Mary's is a disaster and hurting, we're hurting in Cleveland. And when the lake in Cleveland is hurting, we're hurting here. And when Youngstown gets more and more trouble, we all hurt. We're one team, I think. That's going to be my goal, is to say, look, we got to just stop the ego, the turf. Well, isn't that the question? And it really is it's a culture, an attitude that has been existing about not getting business here. So your goal is to change that attitude. That's exactly right, and to get people to raise their game, sir. I get it, I get and the it. only thing I can tell you about that is, you think about getting 218 independent men and women to walk through the door of the U.S. House of Representatives and vote on a bill to balance the budget that happened for the first time in 40 years. It's, but it isn't me. Seriously, it isn't me. That's why I would love for you folks to be able to endorse me. Because, you know, was I thrilled with the Cleveland Plain Dealer? You better believe it. Because it gives me momentum and, and credibility and a team to work with there. We have to lift everybody. And I think if we get lifting, if we get lifting together, I think it's going to be good. Did you ever think you'd be compared to Dick Celeste? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I want to tell you Dick Celeste's story. I was out okay. in uh, Colorado Springs with Dick. He talked me into coming out and making a speech and got me to lower my fee when I did it. And I stayed over at, I stayed, of course he could, right? And uh, so I'm staying at his house. And he says to me, he says, John, did you ever hear the story of when I became lieutenant governor? Yeah, I was elected separately, and Rhodes was elected, and he said I went in to see Governor Rhodes, and I said, Governor, you know, I know I'm a Democrat, you're a Republican, but, you know, I'm really here to help you. And Rhodes looked at him and said, uh, Dick, do you play golf? And he said, no, I don't, Governor. He said, well, I'd suggest you take it up, because you're going to have a lot of time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've never heard that. Why, did Celeste pitch these kind of things? Well, no, the plain the 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 dealer reference to Said that you were reminiscent of Dick Celeste that is oh, in his early I, years. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I think you take the best from everybody. 